Hey everyone and welcome to the chapter 2 lecture for medical terminology. So chapter 2 is a lot of terms that reference the body and different body directions, different ways we can divide up the body just as a whole. And then we also are going to learn some terms about disease and different um, types of diseases and different outcomes of diseases. So still a very general chapter. Starting next chapter, chapter three, we'll start launching into specific body systems. So the first thing we'll talk about in this chapter are the different body planes and the body directions. So the first thing to know is that the body is always imagined or sort of uh, spoken about in standard anatomical position. And this woman here is posing in anatomical position. So it's forward facing with palms facing out and feet flat. And so this is anatomical position for studying the body. Um, you, we can divide the body into different segments using these different planes, basically like think of a giant blade cutting the body in a certain um, uh, two-dimensional plane, three-dimensional plane. So the coronal plane is the first one, and the coronal plane is, imagine a giant blade that cuts the body basically down through the ears. So it cuts it into a front and back half. It's named after the coronal suture, which is a suture line where, where bones fuse in the skull. And so if you imagine a plate going through that coronal suture, that forms the coronal plane. So in medicalese, we don't say front and back, we say anterior and posterior, or ventral and dorsal. Technically, anterior and posterior are movement terms, but they're used sort of interchangeably. So anterior and ventral are often synonyms, and dorsal and posterior are synonyms. We also have special words for if a person is lying face down or face up. So if they are lying face up, they are in a supine position. And the way I remember that is that the word supine has up in it. And so if you're lying supine, you're looking up at the sky or the ceiling. And prone is face down or on your stomach. So an example of where these terms might be used in um, radiography when a doctor orders a scan of a patient's chest, uh, depending on what structures they're looking at, they may want a scan from the back to the front, or they may want the patient turned the other way and have the scan from the front through the back. And the direction, the positioning of the patient is really like, I don't know, a majority of radiologic technology. Um, uh, education, learning how to properly position the patient so you can get good images that meet the doctor's order. So this, I don't know what's wrong with my text here, but it should say postero anterior direction. It's going through the back, postero, and then out the front, anterior. Um, if the woman was facing the other way, it would be antero posterior direction. And so those are two totally different scans. The sagittal plane is, imagine a big blade cutting you straight down through your nose. This is also named after a cranial suture that goes front to back on the skull, the sagittal suture. So the sagittal plane goes right through that and it divides the body into right and left halves. And so one place where we might see these terms used is in scanning. When you're taking pictures, doing a CT scan, and you're looking for, let's say, a brain tumor, all right? Um, if it is a scan section that's right down the center, then that would be a mid-sagittal section or a mid-sagittal plane. And this image right here looks exactly like a mid-sagittal section right in the center, okay? But maybe you need to look towards the side of the brain. So you're going to move the scanner, and then that would be called a parasagittal section. I don't have an image of that, but it would the CT scan scans all the way through, and then you're looking at images of basically individual slices. So a doctor may want to see a midsagittal section, or they may want to see a parasagittal section. Some examples of those those terms in use. 
So when we are moving left to right or or sort of out and then to center um, in the sagittal plane, the directional terms for that are medial, which means towards the midline, towards that mid sagittal plane. And if you're moving in a lateral direction, then you're moving away from that midline. So this can be used for when we're talking about actual movements. So like if you're moving your arm out from the body, you might say it's moving laterally. Um, but surgeons will also use these terms when they're describing a surgery and they maybe are making an incision and maybe it matters whether the incision is in the lateral direction or the medial direction or maybe they're describing the location of something that the um, you know it's a mole or something on your skin whether it's lateral or medial to some other landmark on the body the transverse plane is the third plane and it cuts the body um, perpendicularly to its axis so the axis up and down and then it, it cuts perpendicularly so a sort of i guess mid transverse plane would be right through the belly button but you could have several transverse planes all the way up and down the body there's this exhibit called body worlds that this german artist slash anatomist he like um, injects polymers into dead bodies and like preserves them and then does you know poses them and stuff and it's like a an art slash science display that travels around the world and I went to it once and one of the things on display was a body that was basically cut into like a hundred transverse session, sections so you could see all the slices all the way up through the body um, so the top of the body we the term we use is superior something's to the top and on the bottom we say it's inferior so above superior below inferior and we'll see those terms sometimes in labeling anatomy parts so an example is the vena cava which is of the largest vein in the body um, there's two of them. There's the superior vena cava, which drains all the deoxygenated blood from the top half of your body to your heart, and the inferior vena cava, which collects blood from the bottom half and brings it up to the heart. So, superior, inferior. If we are moving up and down the trunk, the directional terms for that are cephalad. Cephalo is a combining form that means head. So, cephalad means towards the head. And caudad, caudo means tail, so it means towards the tail. These are terms for moving up and down the trunk of the body. We have different terms for moving up and down the limbs of the body. So if we're moving towards the end of a limb, so towards your fingers or your toes, we say it's moving in a distal direction or something that's, that's located at the end of the limb is in a distal position. Whereas if you're moving up up the limb towards the joint like the shoulder or the hip it's a proximal position or proximal location so um, your knee is distal to your hip but your elbow is proximal to your hand so we can use it like that in those directional terms um, some other terms for uh, location like if of a tumor or a laceration or some bleeding if it's on the outer part of the of the body we say it is external or superficial um, an external or superficial injury per se and if it's something affecting the organs inside deeper in the body then we would call it an internal or deep tissue disease or injury Another way that we have division within the body, or we can divide up with the body, is into these naturally already divided cavities within the body. So a cavity is just a, a hollow space, usually filled with some fluid, that is surrounded by bones. And the main cavities of the body are, oh, I thought I had animations here. The first is the cranial cavity in green, which houses the brain. And it's, of course, protected by the cranium, the skull. 
and connected to that cavity is the spinal cavity, which runs down your back. That is the cavity that houses the spinal cord. And it also is fluid filled and it's also protected by bones. It runs right through the center of your spine, of your vertebrae. The next one is the thoracic cavity in purple here, in darker purple. That's your chest cavity. It houses the lungs, but also the heart and a couple of other important, really big vessels and things. The heart actually is, is packaged in, a, in an additional membrane, a cavity within a cavity, if you will, and it's called the mediastinum. So the mediastinum is a, spe is a separate cavity within the thoracic cavity. And then down here, this large cavity in blue is um, sometimes referred to as the abdominopelvic cavity. So the top part is the is what we refer to as the abdomen. And that's where all of your like digestive organs are, your kidneys, your liver. There's a whole bunch of organs in the abdominal cavity. The pelvic cavity you can see kind of goes back a little bit here. And um, the pelvic cavity houses a lot of the reproductive organs in both males and females. So, but technically it's all one actual continuous cavity, but sometimes we will uh, refer to the bottom part of it as just the pelvic cavity. So because there's so many different things going on in that abdominopelvic cavity, there's so many different organs, we also can take the outside of the abdomen and divide it into different quadrants or different regions. And these are useful in a lot of ways. Um, so for example, the quadrants, those are really easily labeled. We've got the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, and left lower quadrant. What you might notice though, that seems odd, is that this is the right side and this is the left side. So if you're looking at this, this picture, that's opposite to your right and left. And that's because we're always labeling the patient's right and left. So if you put yourself in the position of this patient, this is their right side and this is their left side. So when a doctor is looking at a patient, the directions are sort of flipped. The doctor's right is the patient's left. And it's a very important little detail to get straight. That's how, you know, surgeries get done on the wrong leg. If you can't keep track of the fact that it's the patient's right and not your right sort of a thing. Okay, so a patient might come in and say, oh, my, my stomach hurts. I've got pain in my in my stomach or my belly and then the doctor might do an exam to try to to try to you know get a little more specific where is that pain coming from is it coming can we localize it to one of the quadrants because different organs reside in different quadrants and that will give the doctor a little more information about you know how to diagnose this patient same thing um, with the regions regions are even a more specific way to uh, diagram out or talk about different areas of the abdominopelvic region. Um, these will, will oftentimes be used in um, surgery or talking about the location of a tumor or a mole or something like that on the skin. So the central region here is where the belly button is and the belly button is also known as the umbilicus. So this is called the umbilical region. Um, below that is the hypogastric region. Hypo means below and gastro means stomach. So it is well below the stomach, that's for sure. And then the epigastric region is the opposite. It's above the stomach. And really the stomach is like right here. So I don't know how much above the stomach it truly is, but that's what it's called. Then the top right and left corners are the hypochondriac regions. So hypochondriac literally means below the cartilage and your ribs contain a lot of cartilage and it is just below the ribs there at the base of the ribs. The middle sections on either side 
are the right and left lumbar region. If you follow them around to your back, you end up in your lower back, which is lumbar means lower back. And then these bottom right and left corners are the known either as the right and left inguinal region. Inguino means groin. Um, or sometimes they're known as the right and left, an alternate name is the right and left iliac region. Iliac means hip, I-L-I-A-C. So it could be iliac region or inguinal region. They're synonymous and different teachers prefer different ones, different um, physicians or professionals prefer a different term, but they're the same, the same area. Some other terms to know that are important to distinguish between are the terms anatomy and physiology. The, a lot of people think they're synonymous, that they mean the same thing, but they don't. Anatomy is specifically the study of the structures of the body. So when you are memorizing the names of different bones and organs and what they look like, that's anatomy. Um, think of, you know, people doing dissections. That's purely studying anatomy in a dead thing that is not functioning at all. You're just looking at the parts. Physiology is the study of the function of those parts. What do they do? How do they work? How do they not work in, when they're diseased? So physiology is usually a lot more complicated. Anatomy is a lot of memorization, but physiology is a lot of understanding of process. Um, and so we have a lot of levels of what I would call anatomy and physiology at the college. I think medical terminology is a like very, very light version of, of A and P, anatomy physiology, where we really just talk about anatomy. Um, we really don't get into the physiology, how the body functions very much at all. And then as you go to human bio and then anatomy physiology, you build on that. You learn more anatomical structures and you definitely learn a lot more physiology and that's why it gets harder and harder. So when we look at the body and we break it down, we can also break it down on different levels. So the body as a whole, the organism, is made up of several different body systems, which are groups of organs that work together. So here the example is the cardiovascular system. So we've got the heart and the veins and arteries that carry the blood are a system. They're a group of parts that work together for a common function. And they're made up of organs. The organs of the cardiovascular system, well, the real, the only organ, main organ is the heart. I don't think we call veins and arteries organs, but they are certainly parts of that system. And then we can zoom in even more and look at and explore the different tissues of those organs. So in this case, like the cardiac muscle cells or the cardiac muscle tissue. And then we could zoom in even further to the micro level and look at the cells. So anatomy physiology studies the body really on all of these levels. So again, as you progress in initially, you taught like in a class like this, we're talking mostly about body systems and organs. But as you progress in um, the level of anatomy physiology you study, you learn more about how the um, organs function at the tissue level and the cellular level as well. So these different body systems that we're made of all have medical names and can be studied in their own fields um, and how they function. So there's this is the order that they're in in the chapters of this textbook. That's why they're in this order here. It's kind of arbitrary. But we've got the gastrointestinal system, which gastro means stomach, intestino means intestine. So this is the system, the digestive system would be sort of a common name for it. The respiratory system, respiratory means to breathe again and again. So that's going to be our breathing system, um, the cardiovascular system, so on and so forth. So we will get through um, the female genital and reproductive system this semester. If you are interested in the endocrine system or the eyes, ears, nose, and throat, those are additional chapters in the textbook that we don't get to. So feel free to explore those if you want to go into those fields. 
Um, some other terms I want to I want to point out the integumentary system is oftentimes an unfamiliar term to students. The integument is a fancy medical word for the skin. So the integumentary system studies the skin. And so for a lot of these body systems, the specialty or field that studies them, the name of that field is very similar to the name of the body system. We just add a logy or ology to the end. So the gastrointestinal system is studied by a gastroenterologist. The nervous system is studied by a neurologist. The urinary system, urologist, it's urology. Um, but some of them have not matching terms. So for example, a pulmonologist, pulmono means lung or air, a pulmonologist studies the respiratory system. So the names of the system and the specialist are slightly different. Same thing with the skin. We said the integumentary system is the skin. A dermatologist or dermatology is the specialty. Another one um, that doesn't match up is immunology. Immunology is the study of the immune system, but we don't call the organs in our body, we don't call that body system the immune system. It's called the lymphatic system, all of the immune cells are housed within the lymphatic system. So an immunologist technically studies the lymphatic system. Um, and some fields we have special names for. So the female genital and reproductive system has a very generic name, but the specialty is called gynecology. Gynaco means female. So you should know what the different body systems are called. I could ask a question on a test like, which body system is the heart a part of? So you should know the major organs that are found in them, but I'm not gonna ask you um, little small organs that we haven't gone over. Um, bones, part of the skeletal system, and then also be able to know which type of specialist you would go see for a problem with that system, what that specialty is called. Um, like if you're in a hospital and you need and you are looking for someone to help you with skin problems, then you need to look on the directory for the Department of Dermatology. So knowing those terms is important for navigating the healthcare field. There's other specialties as well, again, that are in later chapters of the book that we won't get to in this class, but it's good to know about them. Psychiatry, the medical treatment of the mind. Oncology, onco means cancer. So this is the study of cancers, an oncologist is who you would go see if you had cancer. Um, radiology and nuclear medicine, these are all, these guys often work with oncologists because radiation is often used as a therapy for cancer, but it's also a diagnostic technique. So they work with other specialties as well. For example, if you've ever had to do a barium enema, um, swallow some barium, do a barium x-ray, for a gastroenterologist, the gastroenterologist would order that exam because they want to see what your gastrointestinal system looks like, but you would go to radiology and nuclear medicine to actually get that test done, and then they send the results back. So a lot of these specialists, of course, work together hand in hand. Dentistry, dento means tooth. Dietetics, study of the diet, nutrition. Pharmacology is pharmaco means drugs, pharmacy, drugs. Um, so this would be the specialty of studying drugs and dosages and um, preparing d uh, drugs. Neonatology, neonate literally means newborn. So that is the study of newborns specifically, not just babies. Babies and infants and toddlers and children are all under the field of pediatrics. But newborns have very special needs and have a special, actual um, specialized field within pediatrics. So now for the second half of the chapter, we've talked about um, different ways to sort of divide up the body and talk about the body and also talk about uh, the different body systems, the names of, of the different body systems. 
Now we're going to talk about some terms that have to do with disease. So disease as a term, actually, if you break it down, it literally means without ease. It's a state, like an, it's basically any non-normal state of the body. Um, so disease can be a very broad uh, term. Ideally, the goal of medicine is to prevent disease, uh, or it should be to prevent disease, but we often think of medicine as being there to, or the field of medicine to being there to treat disease. Um, but preventive medicine are things that are actually meant to, to prevent disease. We also call them prophylactic. And things like vaccines are a great example of a preventive medicine, something that you give to people to keep them healthy and keep them from actually developing a disease that needs to be treated. We're also going to talk a lot about different disease etiologies. So the etiology is the cause of the disease. Um, not to be confused with etymology, which in chapter one means the origin of a word. Etiology is more like the origin of a disease. So for example, you might have a congenital disease. Congenito means like you're born with it. It's present at birth. So um, if you are born, a classic example of a congenital disease is cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is um, a neurological disorder that's caused by oxygen deprivation to the brain during labor or um, even in utero. And so it's something that literally happens at birth and then, but then can have long-term effects on muscle control and speech. Um, a degenerative disease is one that gets worse over time. So D is reversal of generation. So degenero means to the opposite of generating. So you're instead of like getting better and better, you're getting worse and worse. And um, a good example, well, there's a lot of degenerative diseases. Uh, let's say um, Alzheimer's is the one is that that's popping into my head. It develops later in life, but it is degenerative. It causes a breakdown of um, brain tissue that results in you know loss of cognitive function. Other things that are degenerative, uh, multiple sclerosis, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, muscular dystrophy. Those are all diseases where you lose functionality over time. An environmental disease would be one that's caused by something you're exposed to in the environment. So if um, allergies, that's a great example of an environmental disease. Allergies are technically a type of disease. You are allergic to cats and when you are in an environment with lots of cat hair, you start sneezing and your eyes get red and watery and itchy um, and those and maybe your skin gets red and blotchy. Right? So that's a reaction, a disease sort of reaction that your body is having to something in the environment. Um, hereditary diseases are genetic. They are things that are inherited from your DNA that's passed down through your family. Um, some diseases have multiple etiologies. So Alzheimer's can be hereditary, but it's also degenerative, right? So Diseases aren't like, it's, they're not mutually exclusive here. Iatrogenic disease, iatro, like iatry at the end of the word, means medical treatment. So these are diseases or disease states that are caused by medical treatment. So any like negative side effects that you have from taking drugs would be iatrogenic. Or if you get an infection after surgery, that would be caused by that medical treatment. That would be iatrogenic. Or some kind of side effects from like the surgical removal of an organ. Um, so iatrogenic diseases are ones, of course, that doctors try to prevent because they can also be sued for them occasionally. But sometimes doing a procedure to save you from one disease results in the side effect of developing another disease condition or injury 
that is caused by that treatment. An idiopathic disease, idio means unknown. So like the word idiot, like somebody who's an idiot doesn't know anything. That, that idio is actually a Greek or Latin root. So an idiopathic disease etiology basically means the doctors don't know what caused your disease. You have this disease, but they don't know what caused it. It's not hereditary. It's not environmental. You weren't born with it. They just don't know. So sometimes you might initially be diagnosed with an idiopathic disease, but then they eventually figure out where it came from, and then they might give you a different eti etiology. But idiopathic means that they just don't know where it came from. An infectious disease is one that can be spread person to person. We also use the term communicable disease. Communicable really means, I should, I take it back. So technically communicable means it spreads from person to person. Infectious disease means that it's caused by a microorganism, like a virus or a bacteria. And probably something like 98% of, of infectious diseases are contagious or communicable from person to person, but some of them aren't. So an example is tetanus. Um, you get tetanus from, a, like oftentimes in a wound, a puncture wound, the bacteria can grow there and you can develop tetanus, but you can't give tetanus to somebody else. A person can't give another person tetanus. So that would be an infectious disease that's not communicable. But don't worry about that. This class, for this class, in most cases, infectious and communicable are mostly synonymous. Um, a neoplastic disease, neo means new and plasto means growth. So any type of new growth, whether it be a wart or a mole um, or a tumor would be classified as neoplastic. A nosocomial disease is one that's acquired in the hospital. And nosocomial, usually when we're talking about nosocomial conditions, we're talking about nosocomial infections, bacteria or viruses that you pick up while you're at the hospital. So staph infections, super common picking up at the hospital in your wounds or from like a catheter um, into the bladder. And of course, during pandemic times, we're concerned about coronavirus being picked up by patients who are in a hospital. So they go in for surgery and they're healthy besides whatever they need surgery on. And then while they're in the hospital, they end up catching coronavirus from other patients. So in a, a hospital setting, what you have is usually a bunch of patients with infectious disease and a bunch of patients who are there for surgery or, you know, um, and are in a very weakened state of their immune system and of their body functionality. So they're very vulnerable to getting infections. And here they are housed with people who have infections. So hospitals um, often are actually really great places to get sick. Nutritional diseases are caused by either too much or too little of nutrients. Usually nutrient deficiencies are what cause the nutritional diseases, but you can also have an overload. You can actually have uh, nutritional toxicities. So iron, is actually toxic in high amounts. People who take iron supplements have to be careful that they don't get toxic amounts, but particularly, they can be particularly toxic in kids. And a lot of kids' vitamins look like candy. They're like gumballs or gummies. And if you don't keep them away from kids, kids can get into them and eat them as if they're candy. And if they contain iron, it can cause a, actually a fatal iron overdose. So the number one cause of poisoning in kids under five, I think, is actually iron poisoning from multivitamins, not from getting in and drinking bleach under the sink, but from eating a whole bunch of iron-containing vitamins. So keep those vitamins away, out of reach from your kids, especially if they're the, they really like them and if they have iron. All right, so when you have a disease, you there's often lots of things that you experience. There's evidence of that disease in your body. And we call those 
the symptoms and the signs. So the signs are things that can be seen, can be measured, and can be witnessed. So for example, if you um, were breaking out in hives and you had red welts all over your body, or if you had a fever, a temperature that can be recorded on a thermometer, um, these are things that are observable objectively by a physician. Symptoms are things that are felt subjectively by the patient. So pain is a very common symptom. There's no way to actually objectively measure someone's pain. You can ask them on a scale of 1 to 10 how bad is your pain, but that's still dependent on the patient's subjective experience. Um, nausea is another one. If you're feeling nauseous or lightheaded, those are things that are experienced by the patient, but there's no way to measure them. Vomiting, however, would be a sign because that is observable. So signs and symptoms are the different things, different ways that you feel off or the different um, uh, physical manifestations of a disease. So different diseases have different sets of signs and symptoms, and we refer to those sets of signs and symptoms as a syndrome. And so if a person is experiencing a, a syndrome, a certain set of signs and symptoms, that will point the doctor towards the diseases that they're potentially going to diagnose them with. Sometimes patients have disease, but they don't have any symptoms. They are what we call asymptomatic. Remember that prefix a means without. So they are without symptoms. And, um, and this can happen. This happens a lot in cancer. A lot of tumors at the early stages are not symptomatic. And they're either found during routine screening or sometimes they're found accidentally when you're getting a scan for something else and then they're like, oh wait, there's a tumor there. Because um, it's not usually until the later stages that you start having symptoms of cancer. Um, even infectious diseases can be asymptomatic. With coronavirus even, there's a lot of um, cases of people who test positive and carry the virus but don't have the symptoms. Their body is able to fight it off effectively. Um, and then there's questions around how much of disease is actually being spread by these asymptomatic carriers that are walking around feeling fine and potentially infecting other people. So not to scare you, I feel like sometimes when I talk about asymptomatic symptomatic disease, then everyone's like, oh my god, I don't have any symptoms, but what disease do I have? You don't. You probably don't. Don't worry about it. Um, at the doctor's office, when you go in with signs and symptoms, they, there's some standard procedures you will go through. So the doctor will do an exam, but first they will ask for the history of the present illness, or the HPI. And that is to, you know, figure out when the, when did these symptoms start um, because especially with diseases, with infectious diseases, that's important to know um, different viruses and bacteria have different incubation periods, for example. You also want to know the patient's past medical history. What surgeries have they had? What diseases have they had in the past? A lot of infections can have complications later down the road, so it's important to know their past history in order to determine, you know, to make sure you have all the clues you need to, to solve the current issue. Then they will look for physical signs of disease. They'll do a physical exam and we'll talk about some of the techniques they use to do that. And then hopefully after the physical exam, they'll have an idea of what the disease is and they'll give you a diagnosis. So a diagnosis is basically the doctor's educated opinion about what disease or condition you have as a patient. And different doctors may come up with different diagnoses. So a diagnosis, I like to stress to students that a diagnosis, it's an educated guess. And so it's not always right. It's not always set in stone. 
If you ever get a diagnosis that just doesn't sound right to you, don't be afraid to get a second opinion from another doctor because another doctor might give you a different diagnosis. And it's really important to get the diagnosis correct in order to give the correct treatment for a disease. Um, so, and most doctors are, are pretty humble and understanding about that, that they um, are happy for you to get a second opinion, most of the time because the second opinion confirms the first doctor's opinion and then they're validated. But also I think all doctors, they really do want their patients to get the best care. And if they're wrong and another doctor can figure that out, then that's good for the patient. And so it's a win-win. So some of the things that doctors might do in a physical exam, they'll do an inspection, which means they use their eyes to look at the body. They may use lighted scopes to look into orifices like the ear or the nose or the throat. Um, they can do auscultation. Auscultation is what we call listening with a stethoscope. So they can listen to the chest sounds for the heart and the lungs, and they can also listen to the abdomen for, for sounds of the in, intestinal system. They can do palpation where they press, especially in the abdomen, um, on, and look for areas of tenderness or look for areas where there's like maybe a mass, looking for any kind of tumor or swelling. Um, and then there's, there's also something called percussion that's often used to look at the lungs, I think, really listen to the lungs. And this is basically just where the doctors like tap and they listen for the sound, if it's hollow or if it's like fluid filled. So they're trained to recognize different sounds that are associated with different internal conditions. So those are four different techniques that you might experience during a physical exam. So if you are diagnosed with a disease, then your first question is probably going to be like, you know, doc, am I going to be okay? And so there are definitely different potential outcomes of disease or what we'll call a prognosis. I'm getting ahead of myself here. So um, I'll go back to this slide. So these different signs and symptoms that you're experiencing may be really severe, like they may have come on really quickly and they're really strong, like you're really, really nauseous or you're in a lot of pain. We call that acute disease. But some diseases are a little bit more mild and long term, and those are chronic diseases. So like maybe you come in because you just, you had a headache for three months or, um, you know, something, some, a joint, you've had joint pain that's been bothering you for months. That's a chronic condition. Um, sometimes conditions, diseases can go away um, or start to get better, but then get worse. That getting worse is called exacerbation. So my classic example for this is like skin um, diseases like eczema. You may be treating the eczema um, with like a, a steroid cream and it gets better but then you put on some kind of lotion that makes it worse, that exacerbates it. Um, remission is what happens when you have a disease and all of the symptoms and signs go away. It's not necessarily gone or cured because some diseases that go into remission can come back or relapse or recur or other terms. So a lot of chronic diseases are like this. Cancers are classic for um, when a cancer, when a tumor disappears, when it's treated and it disappears, uh, the doctors rarely say you are cured. They're, they say you are in remission. And then for different cancers, if you're in remission for you know an X amount of time, then you are basically deemed to be cured. So like for some cancers, if you're if you're in remission for five years, the chance of it coming back is like 0.001%, and so you're as good as cured. Um, other diseases, chronic diseases, and in inflammatory diseases like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and eczema, those things can go into remission. They go away for a period of time, 
but then they come back or relapse. A sequela it looks a lot and sounds a lot like the word sequel, like you have a movie, part one, and then part two is the sequel, what happens afterwards. So some diseases have sequels, where you get a disease and then later you develop another disease sort of that's related to that first one. So um, classic example, an infectious disease is strep. So strep throat is a very common infection. We have antibiotics that take care of it, so it usually doesn't progress and we don't get any sequelae. But before we had antibiotics, people would get strep throat. They get better, but then they also had a chance of developing scarlet fever or rheumatic fever down the line, which could be, which are much more serious. Um, and so another one, I guess maybe that's more modern, that's concern is sepsis. If you get um, a blood infection, it can kill you. And if it doesn't kill you, it often can cause organ damage that then later results in new diseases that arise based on the damage that occurred from that original sepsis infection. Um, so hopefully if you have a disease, there is a treatment for it. If, once the doctor has a diagnosis, they will also come up with a, a treatment plan. Sometimes they can't get a diagnosis, just the physical exam. They may need to order more diagnostic tests in order to come to a good diagnosis and recommend a therapy. So therapy can be medication, can be drugs, pharmacological. It can be like physical therapy where you're doing exercises, or it could be surgery, um, removing something or surgically repairing something that's essentially broken. Some diseases um, don't respond to therapy. So thinking of cancer, where you might be um, prescribed chemotherapy, but the chemotherapy doesn't work and it doesn't reduce the size of the tumor. Or you might have an infection with staph and you take antibiotics, but it's resistant to the antibiotics and they're not working. So if a treatment is not working, then we say that the disease is, is resistant to it or that the, it's refractory. And so sometimes um, therapeutic treatments have to be adjusted as you go. Mental illness is a classic example. There are lots of different therapies for different mental illnesses, both um, getting like talk therapy, different forms of, of actual psychotherapy, but also there are different um, psych pharma pharmaco pharmaco psycho psychopharmacies can't think of the word, but different um, drug classes to treat um, mental conditions and, and psychiatric conditions. And sometimes it takes a lot of adjusting because a lot of times there's different side effects that are unpleasant. And so you have to adjust the therapy. The doctor, when they give you a diagnosis and a treatment plan, will also often give you a prognosis, sort of a prediction of what they think the outcome is going to be. Um, how quickly you should expect to feel better, or what percent chance you have of dying. I mean, the prognosis can be, is, is broad. So hopefully if you get a disease, your prognosis is full recovery or recuperation, that you have an infection, you take this antibiotic for a couple of weeks, and then you'll be good as new. Sometimes a prognosis involves disability. Maybe you have diabetes and you have gangrene, developed gangrene in your foot. And the you know, treatment is antibiotics, but if that doesn't work, you may need to have surgery and have an amputation, which would result in disability. And then of course there are terminal illnesses where the prognosis is there's nothing we can do to save you, all we can do is offer you comfortable final days or extend your life a little bit, but ultimately this disease will kill you and cancer is oftentimes in that family. So the last thing the chapter talks about really is the fact that 
I keep referring to in this lecture, I keep saying doctors, this, doctors, that. But doctors are not the only healthcare professionals. There's actually something like 300 different professions or jobs within the healthcare field. So there are a ton of different people doing all of these different things. Um, the doctor or physician may be the one who does the physical exam, but it might be a nurse or a medical assistant who gets the, um, the history of the present illness. Or if the doctor needs more diagnostic tests done, there are lab technicians and phlebotomists that draw the blood to do the labs that are all important players. So when you go to the doctor and you're sick, you oftentimes see multiple different allied health professionals um, in hospitals around here in rural New York, we have a lot of MDs, medical doctors who are physicians, but we also have a lot of PAs, physician assistants, and nurse practitioners. These guys basically can do the same things doctors do. They can do physical exams and diagnosis and prescribe treatments. They just have less schooling, so they their degree programs are shorter. Um, and they can't, they often can't specialize to become things like surgeons. Physician assistants have to work legally under a physician, so they can't have their own practice, but they can work in a practice and be partners with physicians, but the physicians are sort of the boss. Um, we can have people who are certified nurse midwives. So all these people have advanced degrees and have the ability to do a lot independently. Um, but they have, they, they had to spend less time and money in school than physicians and are a slightly, um, can't, can't reach quite the same levels of, um, what do I want to say? Management, I suppose. Nurses are a huge segment of the healthcare profession and there's different levels of nursing as well. Everything from a nurse aide to registered nurse. Um, and then there's all the technologists and technicians in the labs. You may have a radiologic technologist take your x-rays or um, a phlebotomist draw blood. You may see a therapist, whether it be for um, mental health or for physical therapy or occupational therapy. There's dietitians. There's dental hygienists in the dentist's office. They're, they're the ones that clean your teeth, whereas the dentist comes in and does the exam. Um, so lots and lots of different professionals out there. And all of these people, of course, need to be fluent in medical terminology. So if any of these are professions you're thinking about, it's a good thing you're taking this class. So there's also a bunch of healthcare settings that people can work in. So let's sit, let's pretend, let's take nursing, for example. You can be a nurse and you could practice in a hospital. Um, lots of hospitals around and um, patients might end up having to go to hospitals if they are very sick usually acute it's an, it's considered an acute setting for acute disease when you need surgery but if you don't have acute disease you don't need to stay in a hospital um, physicians offices so where you initially go when you're sick you could be a nurse there you could be a nurse at a clinic um, and again, I'm just using nursing as an example profession, but all, a lot of those different health, allied health professions can work in these different settings. So clinics usually just see outpatients, so they don't have overnight stays, um, but sometimes clinics will specialize. So you can find places that do like diabetes clinics or, um, I don't know, that's the only one that's popping into my mind right now, but for people who have condi special conditions, um, very common conditions, there are clinics that's, that can sometimes specialize. But a lot of the clinics around here are more general, like urgent care is a clinical setting. Uh, ambulatory surgery centers, long-term care facilities, and skilled nursing centers are also other alternative healthcare settings. And the nice thing about those, something like a long-term care facility or a skilled nursing facility is you're working with the same patients all the time. I mean, there is some turnover and you get new patients, but um, you get a little bit more longevity of experience or um, 
a connection with the patients than you do in maybe a hospital or clinical setting where people are just coming and going, coming and going. That can be a downside or an upside for people. Um, home health agencies are becoming more and more popular as people want to age in their homes and not in a nursing facility. And so nurses go to their homes to take care of them. And then there's hospice, which is just a wonderful service um, that provides palliative care. So this is care for people who are at the end of their life. And there, at this point, there's no, there's no treatment to save them or make them better. At that point, there's treatment just to make them more comfortable until they pass. And palliative care is, uh, uh, and there's an um, organization called hospice that does this. And you, there are hospice centers where people can live and stay. And there's also hospice workers that can go into people's homes and care for people as they pass in their homes. And they are there for the patient, but they also have this ad really additional role of really being there for the families. And usually the families of these loved ones are really very, very appreciative of having that care. So that is the end of chapter two. Thanks for watching. Bye now.